first time that that's ever happened to me with the screens going up and down in the middle of the talk, but you handled that amazingly. It was, was incredible. Uh, cool. So we got to learn a little bit about React Native there. And we have one more talk tonight. It's going to be from Eric uh, from Coffee and Code. He's going to talk a little bit about ESS Grid. Hand it over. So I am here to talk about CSS Grid. Uh, my name is Eric. I work at a company called Coffee and Code. We're a small software company here in Akron. And a lot of what we do is help people, help larger teams uh, build, maybe redesign or, or rebuild uh, front ends um, to their, their applications and things like that. So if this stuff is interesting to you, definitely come look one of us up afterwards. We'd, uh, we'd love to talk about it. So obviously, we're going to go over what CSS Grid actually is. A quick show of hands. Who's heard of it? OK, cool. So just about everybody. We'll go quickly through that then. Uh, we'll talk about what it replaces, the way we used to do this stuff, or kind of still do. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that it doesn't necessarily replace. There's a lot of things that are still sort of complementary. And we'll look at how it works specifically, and some of kind of the cool stuff it can do. Uh, we don't have anywhere near enough time to do kind of a full detailed description of, of what CSS Grid is and kind of a full documentation. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of cover the things that are most unique about it and kind of the new things that you wouldn't be familiar with from any other uh, CSS element or property. And then, of course, like everything we do, uh, we'll have to talk a little bit about browser support, but we'll leave that till the end. So what is CSS Grid? Well, uh, at, at its simplest, it's a native recommendation, or a native specification, excuse me, for, for grid layouts uh, for the web. And its current status is W3C candidate, which there's a lot of kind of fine details in there. But basically, uh, it, it's, it's been largely accepted. You, you can get started on this stuff. You can learn it, and you can start to implement it. We'll talk about browser support later. But you can start to implement this stuff knowing that it's not going to change. Uh, it, it, this has evolved over time. It's been debated on. And, and the W3C has said, you know, this, this is the, uh, the specification going forward. And it's for grid layouts. And I don't have a image of what a grid layout is, but if you can picture in your head like a newspaper being the most classic example, uh, you have a, a bunch of different articles. Those are probably in columns. You might have other things that are, are in rows as well as that that could span multiples. You have spaces between them. Um, and, and that's a very kind of old traditional graphic design tool um, that we brought into the web as well. So if you imagine uh, a lot of websites and applications are built on the grid underneath, even if it doesn't look like that, you're still using that concept of sort of boxes laid out in different ways and having relationships to each other. Uh, the interesting thing that we need to talk about with grid layout, especially CSS grid layout, uh, is it allows for two-dimensional layouts, uh, which is columns and rows. Uh, a lot of tools we've had in the past maybe do one or the other, uh, but now we have something that, that has an actual relationship uh, between both of them simultaneously. So what does CSS grid replace? Uh, well, I don't know everybody's history in here, but if you go back far enough, uh, we use tables for this stuff. We just threw everything in a bunch of tables. You had a bunch of hacks to make it work. And tables are great for displaying tabular data. They're really terrible for using to show web layouts. So everybody kind of realized that wasn't the way to do it. We could do better. Uh, we moved on to things like someone talked about earlier, using floats. It was really tricky to do. There was a lot of kind of <clears throat> secret shared knowledge with, as the browser's updated and things like that. Uh, and if anybody's not familiar with floats, that's Simply, you know, you have an element, say it's here, and, and you have some other content here. You can tell this thing, you know, I want you to, to flow right or left, whichever it is. Uh, and, and theoretically, they would kind of position and flow around each other that way. Uh, and sometimes it works at a simple level, and, and that's cool. But then when you need to clear it, or you have different length elements and things like that, it gets really complicated really quickly. Uh, we then moved on. I mean, some, some of that's still used, but uh, combinations of things like relative and absolute positioning combined, and things like display and line block, uh, trying to use some of that stuff. Um, 
And then where, <clears throat> where that ultimately led was the development of a lot of pre-built grid systems. Uh, so a lot of people have talked about bootstrap tonight. That is a, a really good example of one that a lot of people are familiar with. But there's a lot of other things too. And those are really nice as a developer because they say, okay, there's an abstraction here. I don't need to understand all this stuff behind the scenes. I just understand it tells me to put in, you know, at this size, I want six columns or something like that, which is good. But the, the, the clunky thing here is behind the scenes, they're just doing all of this for you still. So all the math is still there. All the complexity is still there. Um, it's nowhere near as good as, as a native specification, which is what we have now. Uh, what does it not replace? Uh, the big one, and someone mentioned this tonight, which is cool, uh, is Flexbox. Flexbox is another technology. It's not quite as new, but it, it, it was released um, in CSS, I think, a couple years ago. They kind of had the same status that Grid does now. And Flexbox allows you to essentially have elements fill a space in, in a flexible way. And that's kind of a vast oversimplification. Um, but this is still really useful. Like CSS Grid doesn't replace that. There's some overlap there. You can use one. You could use either one of them for some things, but I, I think the best thing I've found so far is, is Grid seems really positioned well to maybe create the whole structure, like a layout of a whole page or a whole view or something like that, whereas Flexbox might be useful in that context uh, for, for singular elements within that or a small group of elements, a small group of buttons or something like that. So again, you can look it up. There's a bunch of details online if you look up you know, Flexbox versus CSS Grid, but the big point is that it doesn't replace that. Uh, it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, so how CSS Grid works? Okay, so I have uh, some uh, samples here. Um, these are some of my favorite foods you can prepare on a griddle. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so if you imagine this quickly, you know, just, just bear with me that you have the container and you just have some elements within there. Uh, these wouldn't have to be that uh, order or they don't necessarily even have to be divs or anything. Uh, but we just have a breakdown, pancakes, french toast, eggs, and sausage. So if you go then, and on our container, we drop in this display grid property. These are now displaying as a grid. And it doesn't really do anything visually, which is OK. It is working. They are displaying as a grid, but by default, each element has its own row. And by default, uh, those rows fill the parent container. So visually, we're not doing anything right now until we take the next step. The next step might be to use a property like this, which is grid template rows. And that's one of the kind of new things I want to talk about that you don't see anywhere else in CSS. So what we're saying here, we're still saying, OK, on my container, display this a grid. And then I want to start defining uh, the height of some of these rows. Because as we talked about, by default, a, a row uh, fills its parent container. So when you specify a value there, it's, it's for the height. So what we've done here is we say, OK, the first row uh, makes 200 pixels tall. The second row makes 75 pixels tall. And then the last two, I don't specify, so it's just going to do an auto. And an important thing to note here is that you know my example almost just looks like a list or something, but those could be whatever you want inside there. Those could be divs. They could have content. Um, and they can kind of uh, you know fill up and be used as you need. They don't need to be anything simple. So uh, we talked about grid template rows. The, the uh, complementary piece to that is grid template columns. So in this example, we have our same container. We, we've taken off the rows for just for this sample. So we have displayed as a grid, and then we have grid template columns. And we say, OK, I want to define um, the, the width of two columns. This is obviously the inverse of rows. Rows uh, fill the width. And you specify the height. These work exactly the opposite. So here I'm saying, OK, I want one column that's 100 pixels wide and one that's 50 pixels wide. And because I had four elements, it automatically splits them into two rows. Then we take the obvious next step of combining columns and rows, uh, which you can do, and they are intended to work well together. Uh, this also introduces uh, something else I wanted to mention, which is uh, this FR unit. And that's something that's new to CSS Grid as well. And that is a fractional unit. So it's, it's unitless, essentially. It's not like a pixel or an M or anything like that. And what that, how it works is for your container, you define uh, any number of these uh, FR, the fractional units, and then, based on how many you've defined, uh, it, it's just divided by, excuse me, your value is just uh, divided by that total. So in, for columns here, um, I've specified two columns, but I have an error in my code. Oh, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because that's what happens when you don't do your actual code demos. Uh, but, but the way this works is so you said, okay, I have three 
uh, three units total. I want the first column to, to take two of those available units and, the, and then the one FR just to take one. And the same thing with the rows, I might have you know five and then the, the one <coughs> fills that, that remaining. Uh, there's another cool property that you can do here which is uh, repeat. And I just broke the lines here for legibility. You don't actually have to break the lines. That's not part of the, the syntax or anything. Uh, so we could say grid template rows. Okay, I'm gonna make some rows. Uh, but I don't want to list out every single one. That may not be feasible, or it may just be ugly or take you a long time. So you can just do things like, okay, give me three rows, um, each one 75 pixels. And I can do three columns, also at 75 pixels. And you get a nice little uh, square arrangement of that grid. Uh, there's an, another thing, actually kind of the last kind of unique thing here that, that's been introduced, which is this property called min-max, uh, which is pretty cool. The way it works is you uh, give it two values, obviously the first one being the minimum and the second one being the maximum, and based on your content, uh, that piece of the grid uh, will scale to fill that. So here we've said, okay, you, the, excuse me, the, the row can be as small as we want, but I want the maximum to be you know, 200 pixels in height, and then for something like the columns, you know, I could say, again, an auto or a minimum, but maybe I only want it to grow as big as 50% of the parent container. And then we can tie in some of those um, additional uh, fractional units as well. So uh, there's a ton more that, that I can't cover tonight. Um, the grid gaps, uh, all my examples here, you know, they have the, the lines, the gutters, if you're from that world, between, between the elements. Um, you can define and change those, and you can do lots of interesting things based on those, uh, which is pretty cool, and that's something most grid frameworks don't have, uh, in addition to a lot of this other stuff. Uh, you can really easily set spans on things. You can have uh, an element that, that grows across multiple rows, across multiple columns. Uh, you can name areas, and you can use that in your row and column declarations. So you, you can start to get kind of this crazy, almost like ASCII art uh, breakdowns of you know, define a row as a header and then columns as sidebar and body and things like that. And it, it looks kind of crazy, but <coughs> behind the scenes, uh, if, if you build up to that, it's, it's fairly easy to understand. And then we've been doing a lot with all my little examples here, uh, very explicitly defining the rows, seeing how many we want and what size and the columns and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of functionality included for implicit groups, and it, it will it is set up to do a lot of thinking for you and make a lot of kind of uh, default assumptions. So you don't have to get that explicit and you can kind of go down that route too. Uh, the one thing to know, the thing that is really cool about CSS Grid is that at the end of the day, it's all just CSS. So as you can imagine, some of these examples we've seen, I'm sure if you're a designer, you do any work in that, you, know, you start to picture you know, uh, grid, uh, square grid layouts and you sort of scaffolding views and things like that are really easy to build now. And because they're all CSS, you can really easily change things for different devices, different sizes and things like that. You know, instead of having three rows and columns, maybe at a different size, I just want one, or maybe I want 20, or I want things to change. Uh, and because it's entirely in that presentational layer, uh, it's really easy to do. And it's, it's really kind of a, a sustainable approach in that way. So we talked about a lot of cool stuff, uh, but what about browser support? That's always the, uh, always the challenge here with, with anything new in CSS world. Uh, well, I grabbed this screenshot uh, yesterday. So this is what it looked like yesterday. Uh, the only thing sort of widespread that doesn't do it at all right now is Opera Mini. And I don't know what uses Opera Mini. Somebody told me a Nintendo DS earlier tonight. So you, you will, it will run on a Nintendo DS. Um, uh, big ones over here, uh, IE and just a little bit more older version of Edge. They do support it, but they support an older syntax. So the stuff we've been going through tonight probably won't work as intended. But if your build process or your, your project uses like a CSS preprocessor, you can probably tie that in to, to spit out the older version of the code and just serve it up conditionally for those browsers. Um, but beyond that, it has pretty strong support. It, it doesn't go back super far. You, you have to test kind of for your own context. Um, but I think the thing to remember here too is that, like I just said, it's entirely CSS based. So if it doesn't load, you can always be serving some sort of fallback, or you can always have a very simple uh, display. You know, your, your markup hasn't been affected, your content hasn't had to change at all. So sort of worst case scenario is someone just doesn't get as nice of a display, which is really kind of that, that ideal of progressive enhancement, right? You're still getting something that's still usable, it just may not look exactly the same, which may or may not work for your, your context, but it's good to know. Um, so there's a bunch of references out there. Uh, these are some that I looked at. A grid by example just walks you through a ton of kind of common website layouts. 
like the headers here and then the big image here or hero or something like that and how you might uh, recreate those. Um, CSS Tricks has a really good one. Learn CSS Grid uh, sort of uh, is the route I follow here which starts very simple and just builds on and adds to it. So if that's the way you kind of learn things, that works well. And then CSS Grid Garden is kind of a little game. It's kind of cool. It kind of walks you through, I don't know, moving some rabbits around a little field or something mm -hmm. using this syntax. And it's just, it's just a good way to kind of um, get, so get yourself out of that text editor if that, if that helps you learn a little bit. So, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, come see me afterwards. But uh, it's really cool stuff to be looking into and hopefully incorporate it into your work. So that's all we got in terms of talks tonight. Um, we learned, that's not, I, I learned that's not, anyway, CSS Grid, React Native. I, I have a couple takeaways that I always like to share. Uh, at least I'll give you one main point from everyone that I, I liked. Uh, about the mobile apps, I, I learned that iOS 11 is very difficult to work with right now. And I learned that the emu emulators can only go so far in the mobile hybrid space. Uh, the Drupal stuff, it was interesting to learn that it was HIPAA compliant. I didn't actually think that that was possible, but that's really awesome. And then uh, CMS Critic is another interesting place that I want to check out about um, comparing and contrasting all the CMSs that are available, or at least uh, a comprehensive list. And why we switched to Mutasec was really interesting. I think a big takeaway from that one is don't just update node packages to the latest version. That's generally not a great idea. So if you can uh, make sure everything's working as expected, and uh, yeah, we had a, a bunch of awesome takeaways today. But so again, Byron mentioned um, how's this working? Am I yelling right now? Uh, Byron mentioned the Slack channel. So we always are discussing uh, interesting topics and questions, and just kind of generally hanging out in the Slack channel for Launch League. Um, so if you don't have access to that, get access. It's at launchleague.org, and uh, come join us. We're we're a friendly group, and we love to uh, talk about all sorts of things. Um, also, there's a ton of pizza. You guys didn't do your jobs. So uh, there, there's a lot of pizza. I tried to have two and, and it was amazing. But please, take more pizza if you're on the fence about like, yeah, maybe I can house one more piece of pizza. You probably could. So go do it. Um, and, and if you want to like take some home to your, to your kids or wife or something, then, then get a doggy bag thing too. Um, the slide decks will also be shared in the Slack group. So uh, there's another reason that you should come join us there. What am I missing? We are also, so I think we're good for a little while to hang out and just chat. Is that true? And then we're going to head over to, or some of us are going to head over to Market Street Grill and Pub. Uh, so feel free to join. Other than that, anything outstanding? Thanks for coming out. And thanks so much for Goodyear. This, is, this has been awesome. So, uh, question. For parking, uh, we'll let you out. <laughs> uh, thanks again. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and, uh, yeah.